Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guests and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? I'm feeling good, Jason. I'm on leave next week, so I'm just counting down the hours until I'm on holiday. You've still got lots of work to do, though, before you leave, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll do what I do, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been checked out for the last week. No, no, you've got oh, go. Thank you. Thanks. That's, that's a, a great reflection of the value that I bring. Yeah. Anything else interesting happening at People Diagnostics lately? Well, we've just moved office. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. It is very exciting. Now we can actually um, see who's in instead of just um, guessing who might be working from one of the other rooms. Yeah, that's right. We have been spread out quite a bit, so it's nice to have everyone in the one place now. So yep, yep, yep. That's great. It is. It's nice. We've got some some room to move around, and yeah, our own space and our own bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We well, actually have your own toilet because she's still do. the only female. I so. am. Yes, we're very diverse. Yeah, we're working on that. You keep wanting to hire more males for some reason, though. So. <laughs> I've recommended one person. <laughs> Who was a male? Would you would you prefer that I recommend a, a female that that I don't know very well as opposed well, to? Well, we, we like to recruit the best person as long as they're a female, good person. So we, we need some more diversity. Um, we obviously, we've just hired another woman. Yeah, she's in Melbourne, so it doesn't she's feel in, like we've hired another woman. So. Well... She hasn't started yet, so that might have something to do with it. It will by the time this podcast comes that's, out. That's true. Honestly. So what we're talking about now actually won't be relevant to the listeners. Yeah, let's just move on. Hey? Yeah, let's just move on. Absolutely. <laughs> right. What well, a look, waste of everybody's time I know. that was. Sorry. 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 Yeah. <laughs> look, I'd love to introduce our guest for today. Um, he has close to 40 years of commercial management and director experience in oil and gas internationally. He has, uh, he's a regular witness uh, at Australian government, parliamentary, Senate hearings and inquiries. And he currently serves as the head of division, safety and integrity at the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environment Management Authority. That sounds familiar. That's where Joel's originally from. This is Joel's boss's boss or ex-boss's boss. Welcome to the podcast, Derek O'Keefe. Great. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Joel. And again, um, we work very much as a team there and there was uh, not a great deal of hierarchy. We sort of played to each other's strengths. So uh, very pleased to uh, come back and talk to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Derek. And thanks, Joel, for uh, making the introduction and getting Derek on. My pleasure. It um, took a little bit of doing, but we're glad that we've got you here eventually, Derek. So I um, appreciate you making the time for us. Yeah, the, the third regulator too. The third regulator that we've spoken to, yep. Yeah. Um, third time. Oh, sorry, I got out a little bit. Is this the third time lucky then? Third time lucky. Yeah. We've... <laughs> To work your way through the two other regulators to get to me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We've been building up to this moment. We have. We yeah. have. This is the, yeah, the apex, the apex yeah. of the regulators. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because the others will get cranky with me. Yeah, well, they should hurry up and get on the other two they that should. we're waiting they on. They should. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Derek. Um, before we get into the um, the technical stuff, um, we like to ask our guests about what they like to listen to. So do you have any podcasts that you like to listen to? Well, I do actually, and um, of course, given it's the flavour of the month at the moment, but Corona Cast, so um, Dr. Norman Swan and uh, Tegan Taylor have always been uh, interesting over the little while there to catch up on what's happening, and I just enjoy the different perspectives they bring into the very changing situation. Other things I listen to, um, uh, TED Talks um, and This American Life, you tend to get some very personal stories there from people in very different circumstances. Again, it just allows you to disconnect from what you normally do and, and think about it. And I've got my 40-year-old um, uh, um, uh, record player, we used to call them a turntable actually, and uh, uh, I pull out my collection and, and set that up on the counter in the evening and um, uh, it takes me back a little bit in time, my own version of Desert Island Discs. <laughs> do you do a bit of DJing, Derek? Uh, I haven't got the, the scratchy stuff organised yet. That's probably on the list for um, later in life. Fantastic. I think that's an excellent skill to acquire in retirement. <laughs> All right. Well, can you tell us about your professional career then, please? Uh, a lot of twists and turns, actually. Um, I started as a 
chemical engineer. I was 17, actually, uh, first got into the industry. But when I finished university with my chosen career of uh, chemical engineering, there were no jobs. Um, but looked around and saw opportunities uh, working in the North Sea as petroleum engineering. Had no idea what it was, but I said, I can do that. Uh, adapted and evolved. And uh, the next thing I know, I found myself offshore on a drilling rig. So that was really my pattern in life. I've done a whole bunch of things after that. I've lived and worked in all sorts of places around the world. Um, worked on five continents, worked in deserts and offshore, tops of mountains and a variety of things, bringing my family with me. And they've been of great support uh, to me all that time. Raised three kids, uh, great kids overseas. And unfortunately, they've taken on their dad's mission now. They've left me as well. Um, I've got one in Canada, one in Sydney and one up in Karatha. So that's the danger, actually, is you uh, your kids learn from you and um, they'll put you in the same position as I put my parents in. I've had a great time for 35 years before I joined not seem as the agency, which gave me a background in uh, hands on stuff and different cultures from around the world. So um, this was you know, a time of the career where you go and do something, try and put something back in, try and improve lives for people and uh, fundamentally keep the offshore workforce in a safer condition than they would otherwise have been. Fantastic. And it, um, I, I always enjoyed the work that we did together, Derek. Um, so I can't speak for any of the other inspectors, but. <laughs> yeah. It's just a question of different perspectives, wasn't it? You, you get a diverse uh, range of views there and hopefully you come up with a better solution. That's a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> Uh, great. Well, um, the, the, the offshore petroleum industry in Australia has its own safety legislation, uh, as some people may or may not know. Uh, is it similar to other Australian workplace safety legislation? Um, the offshore legislation we have here has evolved for many, many years. It's currently called the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act, or uh, uh, the Act as we call it. Um, fundamentally, the um, the onus on operators, uh, the people who run and operate offshore uh, facilities there to make sure they have a safe place of work for their employees. And that's all encompassing. Um, and from that, because it's an objective based outcome um, or out outcome based, um, we, we're not prescriptive about how people actually go about that. But what we do require is that they continuously improve the methods and indeed meet that aim of having a safe place of work. So it is a bit different, uh, but I think the fundamentals are still there in, in duty of care, um, maintain a safe place to work and continuous improvement. Yeah, great. So um, then what, what are the obligations of operators and employers in relation to the psych health and safety of their workforce? It's an interesting point in that to date, there hasn't been an explicit requirement for that. There's been overall obligation in terms of maintain the health uh, of employees and uh, a workplace that is um, uh, healthy for them. Um, there are proposed changes coming up in legislation. The government's currently considering that, which would make it more explicit as to the, the impacts on mental health. There's a paper that was published only in the last week, actually, um, by the government. Uh, you can find it on uh, search on offshore oil and gas safety review. Um, you'll find that as of uh, early July, it's published and it provides detail in there of what the government's proposing to do to make it more explicit in terms of uh, in, impacts or the potential risk and impacts on mental health. Yeah, I was actually going to ask that. Obviously, um, there's been some recent um, uh, movements towards incorporating psych health and safety more so into the regulations. And we've seen Safe Work New South Wales publish the first uh, industry agnostic um, uh, code of practice around psych health and safety. Obviously, uh, there was one here in WA for FIFO uh, mental health before that, uh, but that was specific to that industry. We know that Queensland and Victoria are, are busy drafting their own uh, code of practice around psych health and safety as well. Um, so will there be a code of practice or something similar um, within the offshore petroleum industry? Well, I guess general thing about anything that's written in law is that the law rarely has the time to keep up with changing events. And, and in particular, COVID last year meant that events got ahead of us. And what I can say is notwithstanding any explicit mention of psych health within the, the, the workforce obligations there. Uh, what we did uh, in Lopsema was actually look out. So we engaged with the states, the, the states you mentioned there, and we actually looked at how to actually um, share knowledge there for the basic benefit of all, of all. And we looked around the world, we looked at what best practices were there and we publicized it. And what we found was that simply by people being available 
or aware of other opportunities to improve the quality of life of people, this was taken up in many, many cases there. So I don't know you necessarily need laws to drive things. I think you need uh, uh, hearts and minds and changing situations that enable us to get there. So I think that, yes, that the, the law is likely to change that subject, of course, the, the government doing that and pushing it through. But ultimately, it doesn't mean that we have to wait for the law before we take up good practice and apply it. Yeah, absolutely. We've already seen that. I mean, Joel and I have been having a number of conversations with, um, you know, even oil and gas companies coming to us and, you know, uh, they're inquiring about, you know, how can we do risk management more effectively? Uh, and it's interesting hearing the conversation go from the well-being kind of angle, like we're providing lunch and learns, we're providing, you know, uh, fitness kind of equipment and gym memberships and this sort of thing, and, and companies wanting to evolve and mature to the point where they're now applying risk management, as you say, continuous improvement as well to their activities uh, and really thinking about their role as the employer or their obligations as an employer, rather than pushing it down on the individual to take care of their own mental health. The, the other interesting thing then is that you, you talk about the, the sort of the breadth of it there is that whilst the legislation may point to the individual worker, what we've seen, particularly with the COVID thing is you're not just talking about the worker, you're talking about all of society. You're talking about their families, the impact they've had uh, as a result of changing travel arrangements, the rosters and so on. So whilst you could look at the individual worker there, we've been taking a much, much broader view of life and looking really about all the factors that will go to a productive, healthy employee and one that's um, uh, in a safe place to work there. So uh, I think it's, you, you know, it's, COVID has taught us this is a global issue here. We need to think much more broadly and um, in much longer term than I think we've been doing in the past. So again, it's one of those aspects there is just, you know, you're doing the right thing, you've got the laws and that, but I think we've also learned a great deal as well as to, by sharing information, create better opportunities to do uh, better things and protect people for whatever is in front of us or whatever is down the road at us. Yeah, and I think there's um, this increasing understanding, right, that stress is not just confined to the individual worker. Um, really, we have to, if we think about the micro level, yeah, we can think about that. But then if we think about the systems level, then we can think about workplace processes and psych hazards and that sort of thing. But as you say, we also have to think about the macro. Uh, you know, we've got a global pandemic. You know, um, uh, there's been a, a lot of economic uncertainty and economic downturn. We've been largely um, shielded in, in Australia, thanks to the resource industry from that, but in other parts of the world, definitely. Um, and so we really have all of these events and we know it's that cumulative effect of different stresses that can lead to adverse health or mental health implications. So yeah, it's, it's great to see that you, you're taking that bigger picture view and not just looking at, at the individual. Um, it's a very complicated picture as well. I mean, you talk about the economic effect of it, but what happened in January of 20, just before we discovered what COVID really was, the oil price collapsed. Mm. That led to a massive shock through the oil industry, which we're probably going to see for years. And whilst the oil industry is cyclical, the shock actually occurred two months before COVID came about. And oil companies were starting to react already. There was questions about whether they had enough funds to, to operate. And there was a whole bunch of dramas out there. So you've got a very complicated picture there where the oil companies are starting to respond to that on a global nature, given this global industry. And then you had the Australian domestic economy about the stay at home orders that we had there, the failure to or inability to move people around the country or internationally. So, so it's a very, very complicated picture we had there. And you can't just focus on one bit. You've got to take that broad view, gather up as much information you can and respond accordingly. Yeah, uh, it, was, uh, it was a real show of, of some description, <laughs> maybe brown coloured uh, at that time. <laughs> uh, I know one of the clients that we were dealing with, they lost two thirds of their market cap pretty much overnight, like you say all of those mm. macro events hitting at the same time over the space of a few months, uh, early 2020. Um, yeah, really big impacts on, on the industry. But sorry, Derek, just to take us back to the, uh, the legislation changes that mm. like they'll be coming in. Um, we are also getting inquiries about that and, you know, companies wanting to get ahead or on the front foot of those proposed legislation changes. Do, do you think there's going to be um, much change occur um, in the offshore petroleum industry as a result of the incoming legislation changes? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think in terms of the letter of it, again, if you look at the um, offshore oil and gas safety review, um, it starts to lay out there what government's intent is in the form of policy. But of course, that is policy. It's got to go through legislation yet. But one of the things that's flagged there is, is that um, the current act doesn't actually include a definition of health. 
And so up until COVID came around, the term HSE that everyone used to roll off the tongue, tongue had a small H. And then when COVID came about, suddenly the H became a capital H and it didn't just mean day-to-day -day physical health, it meant a whole bunch of stuff. And I think that's really where the lights went on. So whilst it doesn't include a definition of it, um, it's generally considered to be a you know, general overall physical well-being in that. However, it can include mental health. But if you look at the World Health Organization, and it's referenced again in the government document there, is they define it as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So things start to move in that space there. And that's certainly in terms of what the government's looking at in terms of the policy there. So what's likely to happen? I think that it, uh, subject to the legislation we draft and going through and that is, is that um, the responsible people on facilities there will be required, um, just quoting now, to take all reasonably practical steps to provide and maintain a working environment at the facility that is safe and without risk to health. And that's different from currently, which the concept of the physical environment, which implies machinery and fingers and toes and so on, you've now got a more holistic work environment. Now, what change is that going to make? Well, what we hope to see then, if, if that comes through then, is that it starts to elevate mental health as being at that more holistic approach to the working environment there. And that's a more positive work place culture in relation to the, the employers and society now view that the mental health of the workforce is actually important rather than just their physical health. It's all a bit subtle, um, and I think we're working in that space already, um, but that's where I think the prescription, if you like, of the law will be, and then we'll have to determine how that's, de how that's uh, defined and applied. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, you know, will it, won't they, like how's this going to look when it's actually drafted up, as you say, um, before we see. But um, yeah, I, I do tend to like that definition of mental health from or, or health from the World Health Organization, really putting it on, into the positive rather than just the absence of illness. And good to see that, you know, we're looking at, expansion just beyond the, the physical health and safety of employees to the psychological health and safety as well. Okay. So Derek, um, can you, for, for our listeners, um, give us a bit of an overview of um, what action NOPSEMA will currently take when an operator or employer fails to provide a psychologically healthy working environment? Um, Joe, it's an interesting point. And in our world, it's all about prevention. It's not just about being really good to sweep up afterwards and take action because it's far more effective if responsible parties, the operators and the, the people in charge of the work, they're actually preventative measures in place in the first place. And that's our expectation. So really, if we need to take enforcement, it's because the other measures haven't been applied. We believe they reasonably could and should, and they haven't been done. So yes, we do carry out enforcement. Um, but We've got a series on our website, again, a whole bunch of stuff about um, uh, human factors as they relate to employees. Um, uh, we've published during COVID again, um, safety alerts in relation to impact of roster changes on employees and not just them, but their families as well. So we, we try to be in that preventative space. So if I try and answer your question then, um, we had an event, again, it's on a website if you want to have a look for it, uh, relating to um, a vessel uh, that was offshore. There was a worker who had been um, uh, subject to uh, harassment and bullying had taken time off and went back to work again. And we took a view that the employer hadn't actually done enough to recognise the potential workplace risk of putting that employee uh, back in the workspace again, notwithstanding the events that led to the bullying in the first place. But um, we felt that that was uh, inappropriate. We measured that against um, uh, general standards of, of what you expect to do to your care for somebody, to, for the employees and that. And we felt that it actually dropped below the required standard. We took enforcement. So we obligated them now to, to put such a mechanism in place there. Again, you can get the full detail of that on a website. So we are prepared to step in and we'll do that in relation to uh, ensuring that workers are properly treated. But again, the main point is prevention. And if people know about this and they put reasonable measures in place, people wouldn't be subject to that. It's all about prevention. Get to the left-hand side of what we call the bow tie, preventative measures rather than reactive and sweeping up afterwards. Yeah, and I mean, certainly um, in my time there, we would, um, you know, I, I um, contributed to a couple of inspections where we did actually look at systems of work that were designed to to do that prevention, to sort of identify what the hazards were and to, to mitigate the risks associated with them. So yeah, it's not just about waiting 
for regulators waiting for laws to be broken and people to be injured before intervening, but it's mm. it's very much about proactively going in and almost auditing um, the system to to see where the gaps are and um, trying to um, provide an outside set of eyes to um, identify where there are those opportunities for improvement. I think there's another concept um, that we're running at Nopsim, which is find one, fix many. In other words, you find an issue. You identify what the issues is and you publicize it then so that everybody else can learn from it. This isn't a question of find one, fix one, find one, fix one. We would never get done. This is a bit like standing on the side of the highway and, and handing out speeding tickets. You're just not going to get anywhere. So publicizing these issues here, um, we've done it through our regulator magazine. So we, we talk about mental health there extensively and uh, the enforcement when they're, they're necessary there is a way of actually providing lessons for people to say, ah, that's required standard. I wasn't aware of that. There's other information out there. I've got other opportunities to identify what the risk is and practical measures to deal with that risk. And that's what we'd hope to happen there. Um, and again, follow up through compliance monitoring and make sure that people are doing that. But I think there's enormous part of this can come from seeking to influence folks by saying, this is what good behaviors look like. Um, here's an example of bad behavior. Uh, there's a bit of risk gap. Where would you prefer to be? Yeah, it brings me back to my uni days, um, thinking about um, uh, what, what would we call it? I, I remember yeah, looking at uh, safety and uh, vehicle safety in particular perceptions towards speeding. And uh, one of the things that came up was that, you know, speed cameras weren't uh, particularly effective in changing behavior because there wasn't that high visibility, but high visibility enforcement, seeing the police officer actually out on the road or pulling someone up. Uh, definitely change perceptions and change behavior. So it sounds like you're going about the same thing, right? It's high visibility well, enforcement. When we enforce something, we make, it, make sure everyone knows about it. Yeah, and one of the things we do is, is uh, we carry it offshore inspections. All our folks look very similar, the same coveralls that go offshore there. And as soon as we get offshore, we'll get to meet the health and safety representatives. So the visibility is key there. It gives the health and safety representative an opportunity to give us a flavor of the general nature and demeanor of the workforce and stuff, which means we can start looking at that. So that's one of the key measures we do. And we do it for every single time we go offshore. We will always meet the health and safety representatives. These are the representatives of the different work groups there. It helps give a measure of the culture of what's it, what is it's not just physical presence on the facility so there. You take a measure of how people are feeling, are there particular stresses there? And again, I went offshore back in uh, August of last year, the first offshore inspection we did after the uh, um, slowdown because of the risk to health for everybody for COVID. And that was the first thing we talked about is, how are you? How are you feeling? Um, and we learned a number of stories about people that actually haven't been home uh, to visit their families elsewhere in the world for months. And there's you know, issues re relating there. So yeah, visibility is key. And I think that from that, you get a level of trust for the workforce to explain how they're feeling there. And maybe we can help support that. Yeah, we make an interesting point, right? Nopsim is in a really interesting position where it's not just hearing anecdotally from people in, say, the CBD offices, what is it like out in your offshore facilities? You actually do have the ability to go and inspect and, and actually see the people on the ground. So with that kind of perspective, what formal or informal trends, trends has Nopsim observed in relation to psych health and safety in the offshore industry in the last couple of years? Um. I mentioned in January of 20, there was the oil price collapse. And given that we've seen those many times before, that puts a lot of fear in everyone out there, notwithstanding anything else that happens after that, because it means job losses. And indeed, we did see from March of last year, there was a significant drop in the number of hours being expended offshore, which reflected in, in part projects that were canceled, drilling rigs that were stacked, um, uh, work that was programmed, and then the second part was from the COVID thing is operators naturally took people off platforms because it was better for their health. So increased social distancing, less density of people out there. So you wind up with these. So that, if you like, was the trend, which was fear factor from oil price collapse, fear factor because of what was all happening to us in terms of the COVID thing and reduced hours been spent offshore. And you go, I wonder what they were doing. Were they doing something that could actually be important to maintain the, the safe uh, well-being of other people out there for example critical maintenance and so on so we started to look at that uh, back in uh, Ju june of last year to find out what were the effects of covid so i think we're still undergoing substantial change um, what has happened it led through a series of 
uh, events then the global industry oil and gas of which i'm part of that i've lived and worked all over the world there suddenly stopped how do you now deal with emergencies we've been very reliant on having specialists that you can move very quickly around the world to be able to deal with issues and suddenly you couldn't do that so you need to find alternatives or stop the activity so that was a big trend and we haven't really recovered from that yet uh, particularly in australia with our closed borders and indeed elsewhere around the world so there is a an issue in relating to having the right skills available at the right time and on demand for when things go wrong. So that's part of a trend. We've seen for the first time uh, on a drilling rig in Australia, 100% Australians. It's really, really unusual. Part of the international community, you get Aussies working elsewhere in the world and you get you know, Americans, Canadians, Brits, and um, um, folks from all around the world, in, Indian, um, from Thailand, so on, all, just all on the rig. You get the big community there and suddenly you didn't. So what environment does that create when you've got 185 people on a drilling rig there who maybe have never worked together as a team, given that other teams move around the world together? You get up. So it's a very complicated situation. So trends, multiple trends, all very complicated, significant change in industry there. People not able to move from Victoria to WA mm. to go to work. You know, um, or a fear that if they do come to WA and they go offshore, if they go back to Victoria, they may not be able to come back. Now, that was a story from three weeks ago or a month ago. It will change tomorrow. Right now, the issue is New South Wales. As we speak, it's the 9th of July today. But it is, it's, it's a very, very fast moving. And frankly, I've never seen anything like this before. So you talk about trends. The answer is mm, a number of strands building up there uncertainty sitting around there and obviously an impact on on all of us you know you're sitting uh, uh, in office there but many people are not even able to do that today not just in australia but elsewhere around the world yeah that's right uh, really interesting uh, lots of things going on at the moment all combining together as you say um so i guess following on from that um looking ahead what would you say are some of the key challenges ahead for the offshore industry um, in relation to, to the psychological health and safety of the workforce? Um, I guess one of the first things you need to do in any situation um, in dealing with the problem is recognise that you've either got one uh, or you're going to have one. And that is the first step that allows you then to deal with it. And I think there's so many uncertainties sitting out there right now. Um, of which mental health is part of it. Financial stability might be another part there, ability to move people and equipment and so on around the world. So it's a big complicated picture there. So um, what I think needs to happen is um, recognition is a problem and be prepared to hit the pause button every now and again, where you go, oh, things are moving too fast. I think we just need to slow things down. We need to take our time out. That's probably one of the biggest points of defense any of us will have there is I'm not sure, let's just, let's just pause for a moment, take stock, and when we're ready to move on again, and I think in a rapidly changed situation, that's probably the best advice you can give to anyone. If you're not sure, just stop. Um, so I know that, um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, sort of critical maintenance and that sort of thing. Um, we've spoken in the past about um, financial pressure um, and the impact that that can have on operator decision making and sort of resource allocation and that sort of thing. Um, do you, is there any evidence of that um, having an impact on on the mental health of the workforce? Um, we've seen, and it, it's really difficult to connect these things together. We, we know generally when the oil price went down, that meant there's probably less money in the system. And we know that there was stability issues there in, in some areas and that. But funny enough, the oil price is now sitting back up at 70 bucks or so. So it's actually quite volatile. So it's, it's all actually come back again, at least in that respect. So I think what the oil industry needs is stability. And currently it doesn't have it. Um, I think there's probably renewed enthusiasm uh, at, at this point in time. So um, maintenance, uh, one of the things that we have observed is uh, a reduction number of offshore hours. We're, we're currently actively looking at that. We've written a number of papers on that and we've published on this and we're, we're keeping, we're letting industry know that we are now looking at this. Um, the workers, um, they are also being tuned into it uh, to report issues that they're seeing as falling behind. Uh, we saw some events recently where we were surprised that workers hadn't reported certain maintenance issues. And we said, well, mm, 
we're not very comfortable about that. Why is it that, you know, 100 people, whoever it was on that particular facility there, would not have observed that as being an issue there? Is, is there something happening from the outside that people are becoming conditioned? They don't see this anymore. So we're trying to reinvigorate that, that concept there that everybody's got the eyes and ears out there to be observed these things. And if things get missed, then they can get picked up and, and acted upon. And again, you'll see on our website, you'll see some examples there where we've had to act because maintenance hasn't been done. And we've again pushed the action back to the operator. So look, you better go and find out what's wrong with the system. You appear to have a very good system to manage this work, but for one reason or another, the work wasn't done. Who knew? At what level was it? And and did everyone have a part to play in it? You know, where was where was the workforce and all that? So it is, again, it's an interesting, complicated picture there. I think we're in changing times. I think we just got to keep reminding people that the risks are out there and keeping people alert to things that anomalies it doesn't look right and be prepared to say i'm not comfortable with this can we stop and take a look at this do you think that there's a um a, a relationship there with um sort of job security we observed uh and we have observed this over the years is is that sometimes casual workers there have got very short-term contracts there even though the project appears to roll on for some time so one of the things that we do is sit down with the uh, um, the operators and say, look, you know, you appear to have a, a stable piece of work there, and actually, we feel that um, if the employees had more stability in the workforce there, you might get a better performance from the workforce. So this is something that we try and impress upon them. We don't have any powers to act in that space because nothing obviously unsafe in that space. But nonetheless, we try and provide advice because that's one of the things that we is under our mandate as a regulator to provide to promote. Good practices and advice in that respect there it is to consider better ter better terms for their employees there that would enable them to have um we hope their their, their eye and the mind on the ball uh, more often yeah and i guess there's also the um the, the willingness to speak up um when you do see something wrong if you if you have a level of job security and you sort of aren't worried that you're going to be you know no longer required um after your next trip home well, the offshore workers do have rights in that respect and the ability to speak up. But, you know, as I said earlier, laws uh, may not necessarily get you to where you want to be. Whilst that might provide the ultimate backstop there, you'd like to think there's actually a culture out there of people actually being able to speak up and it be welcomed uh, as a means of actually identifying what, what the risk is. So us as an agency, we deal with safety. We don't get involved in industrial relations, which sometimes can cloud that issue there. What we try and do is keep focused on the matters of safety and the behaviour of workers and their employees in relation to performance of safe work. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. Yeah, there is always um, some area of overlap um, between sort of safety and IR, um, so it can get a little bit messy sometimes. Well, again, it's it's uh, just turning another issue in terms of the, the feedback that we've had. So uh, again, through our website, we offer uh, advice to workers offshore if they feel uncomfortable about safety. The first thing is speak to your supervisor. Uh, speak to your HSR, health and safety representative, and then gradually work your way through the system and ultimately pick up the phone and call one of our focal point inspectors. And we do get regular information from people who very often are not actually sure, and you can uh, provide them some advice then about things to look at. And sometimes those concerns actually go away. They aren't actually aren't there. Um, but the, the employee may not know that, and so that makes it a valid concern. So very often these issues dealt with through better communication, and people may not be aware that those safe systems are in work, and in the absence of it being explicit in front of their face there, they assume it's not. So sometimes there's a valid concern, but it could be addressed through better communication in closing that gap. So we get some of those, um, we try and provide that advice, and then of course there's an online that people come to us, and so we gather up information in various spaces, we carry investigations, they would go and look at certain things. Um, and overall, we're, we're trying to um, fundamentally push that risk um, uh, back to where it belongs, which is with the operators there, get them to recognize that the workforce actually can add enormous value to them in multiple aspects. They're the frontline workers able to access, identify the risk, and actually it, it may be for the for the good of all. Mm. Yeah, so, such an interesting um, uh, take today, Derek. And obviously the offshore petroleum industry has gone through a huge upheaval since January 2020, as you said, with so many macro events happening. 
Uh, great to see uh, from your perspective that, you know, the oil and gas industry is is ready to start taking more notice of, of psych health and safety. Like you said, there's people who are already getting on the front foot, even without the legislation, because they understand it's the moral thing to do and the right thing to do rather than just the legal thing you to do. You get a bit of workforce too. You yeah. less risk. Why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, that's right. You know, so um, tell us then, it, it seems to be heading in the right direction. So what are your future? Uh, what, what are your hopes for the future of workplace mental health, particularly in the offshore petroleum industry? One of the things that we observed through COVID was there was suddenly a common enemy out there. There was no competitive edge in it. Um, so not seen as part of an international group um, between the US and Canada, Norway, Mexico, Brazil, UK, Denmark, and so on. Um, and we're part of the management group there. And so one of the things that we did was we went out to find out what people are actually doing in relation to the management of COVID. And we didn't differentiate between the mental aspects and the physical aspects at all. We just simply said, what are you doing? We gather information and we published it immediately. And that went out worldwide. One of the interesting responses we got was from a helicopter company in Canada who said, oh, okay, well, if you're sharing that information, then we'll share ours. And it was in relation to the ability to take people off a facility and get them to a place of safety in the event they were an actual suspected COVID case. Now, having a protocol in place is enormously important for the offshore workforce because it means that's your lifeline there. So is that directly linked to mental health? Probably, I think, because it reflects the, the overall well-being. But they shared that with us and the rest of the international community but on one condition. The condition was that if we could improve it, that we needed to tell them that, but otherwise we could use it. And I thought that was a fantastic measure of collaboration that we've never actually seen worldwide before where you've got a common factor. So my point here is if we could do it for that, then why don't we do it for other things? Why don't we do that and have greater level of sharing collaboration there where it relates to safety, to enable people to, uh, to be able to better deal with the situation. So specifically, what are we doing? Um, we publish a lot on this. Uh, we've got a consortium with uh, a tripartite relationship with um, the industry and the unions. Uh, I've been chairing that now for a year and a half since COVID started. Uh, what we do is um, get the issues on the table there, deal with safety, communication goes out, uh, from that, we developed a mental health working group, um, and from that, uh, we've commissioned uh, a study through uh, two universities, through Curtin and UWA, to take on board some existing work relating to onshore workers uh, on mine sites and so on, and applying that now to our learnings from offshore, compounded, of course, by the impact on industry and COVID and so on. So, so we're actively looking in that space there. Now, that piece of work there, I'm sure, will form part of the body of work overall there. It may be applicable to certain people. It may not be. I know there's other studies and things happening there. So I think overall, there's a greater spotlight now on the importance of mental health. We can all feel it around us uh, in our own lives as well, our families from around the world, as well as the immediate workspace there. And collectively, I think we've got a better opportunity now to actually see that risk, identify it, and again, put practical measures in place. Yeah, it's terrific. We're definitely seeing a lot more collaboration happening. I mean, in Australia, we've got the Corporate uh, Mental Health Alliance um, for workplace mental health uh, globally. Uh, you know, we've got BHP, for example, uh, on this uh, global corporate mental health uh, uh, alliance as well. So there's uh, all these these groups. And uh, from what I've heard from people who are participating in that is that there's just so much sharing um, openly about, hey, these are the different things that we're doing. And hey, let's seek to improve each other's practices by sharing this information, which is fantastic. The next problem we're going to have is overload. And we yeah. started to see that through COVID. There was there's so much sharing happening is you've got this wall of information coming in and trying to pull things out. But I think I prefer to have that problem to be able to sift through and find solutions that appropriate to a particular situation than, than, than actually either make it up yourself and miss opportunities there or, or, or have nothing at all. Yeah, and Joel and I hope we're participating in that collaboration with uh, all the free information that we're putting out <laughs> through the podcast and through, uh, you know, uh, free training that we're putting out and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely getting in the spirit over here as well, Derek. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's also is an acceptance of it is, is that before it's sort of under the covers and, you know, yeah. and now you say, actually, hands up who hasn't felt stressed in the last year. <laughs> You know, yeah. it, it's, um, you know, and 
I think I think now is, is is actually a great time to actually be addressing this. We can maybe thank COVID, if you like, for having brought that to us. But I think it's broken down a lot of barriers there and, and recognition that actually, I mean, uh, I, I've got a, a son in, in Canada. He's basically been locked down for the last year and a half of that. And he's 29 years old. I mean, that's not a space you want to be when you're 29. Um, but it's, you know, we've all got our individual stories. Um, and I think all of us can now relate to it and go, well, yeah, actually, I think, and, and basically look after each other. Yeah. More contact, more communication, more support, call trees, this sort of thing, recognize that well, I haven't heard from someone for a while, give them a call, um, you know, uh, actually sit down and rather than get straight into business, you say, how are you feeling today? And don't just give them a, a, a Tim Tam. It, it's, you know, uh, as we do once a year, is it, uh, are you okay day is, is actually is more regular check-ins with people, look for those signs that people, maybe things aren't quite the way they should be. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Because this didn't just come out of the blue. There's people who have been working in this area for decades. Uh, the ISO standard uh, 45003 for psychological health and safety at work started being produced or drafted two, three years ago. Um, but you're right, I think COVID has really put this in the limelight and people are really understanding the impact of these macro events on stress and mental health. And I really think it has brought our, our agenda forward probably a good three to five years. Um, so we can definitely thank COVID for that at least, right? Like understanding that people are human and stress is normal. Yeah. yeah. So Derek- I'm not sure to for anything, yeah, but- Well, if we have to thank lines. you for anything, right? Like I am the yeah. violent optimist. You apparently. are the violent optimist, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Silver linings where we can find them, right? Um, so, do you have any words of advice for professionals who might want to work in the area of psychological health and safety, um, maybe particularly in an offshore industry? Um, I, I think it's changed in stature and scope in the last year and a half because, as I say, we're all a little bit more comfortable with recognising that we're all in this together. So I think we've got COVID to thank for that, if we're going to thank it at all. Um, and as a result, that creates opportunities because there's a demand for services. And one of the things I'd, I'd like to point to is um, there was a business book written some years ago. It's by Jim Collins, and it was called Good to Great. It was all actually about business, and, and there was a whole bunch of issues and, and uh, lessons that came out of that. Anyway, from my perspective, I've extracted three lessons out of that, and I apply that to anybody who wants to work anywhere and whatever they want to do. So it's as applicable, I think, for people who want to work in um, uh, mental health uh, with a re relation to the offshore industry or indeed anywhere else. So the three lessons, if I can, is find something that's of value to you and society. Well, I think got a big tick in that box now. Um, what that does is that's going to keep you busy and it's going to get you paid for what you do, right? Now, that's not everything. That's the first bit. The second bit is become good and very good at what you do. That's lifelong learning. In other words, you've got to keep up with trends. You've got to keep educating yourself, keep learning, be prepared to learn. What that does, that becomes your competitive edge. It means that it allows you to compete for other jobs and get better jobs and maybe better awards from those jobs. So you don't just get a job and stop, that's box one. It's box two, which is become good and very good at what you do. And I think you've got a duty to do that. So now you've got a job and you're well paid or whatever rewards you want and you're kind of done, but I don't agree because I think the third box to me is probably as important and that's called passion. Because if you don't have passion, you're not going to get through the ups and downs. Yes, you've got your job, but when things, the chips are down, like we've had through COVID, that's the opportunity to reinvent yourself and recognize as to um, where can I apply my skills now? What can I do? How do I get out of bed in the morning and become inspired? I want to do it. And part of that comes from the inner self of being inspired in that finding a particular skill, an area to work, a thing you'd like to do, the reward you get from there, and having that passion to be able to get after it day after day. And when things go up and down, as they do in the oil industry, and indeed many other industries, you will have downtime. But the question is now is, is where's that passion? So I think that you you need all three of those. That's what I've extracted from uh, uh, Jim Collins' book there. Um, find something of value. That would appear to be a value right now. Become good and very good. So lifetime learning and all the studies you talked about now and things happening there, we've got to keep learning and not just in our field there. We've got to be broad in that and then have that passion to work your way through that. So that's the advice I can give 
to your people, as indeed the advice you give to everyone in Bahrain on a career. Thank you, Derek. And I think um, a, a lot of that um, is sort of echoed through the positive psychology research as well about, um, you know, what um, what you need to have a, you know, a flourishing life and a life of, of positive mental health as well. So, um, well, well supported advice there. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably the most practical advice anyone has given. Um, I agree. So far. Yep. Yeah, and, and nice <laughs> three points. It's like uh, yep. my dad's a minister of religion, three point sermon. It's great. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like those <laughs> well, three. The funny thing is, um, you asked me at the beginning what my career was, but actually, um, if I didn't have to work for a living, I'd be a teacher um, because my passion is is actually coaching and teaching, and I um, I'm sort of an unofficial uh, coach and, and mentor. I'm not paid for either of those, um, but you know I've got a day job to do as well. But it's about the next generation, about passing on, and and you know getting ourselves through this difficult time because there will be other difficult times ahead. So, um, yeah, I'm an all man through and through. That's all I've ever done. But you know what? It's about the future generations now being able to pass that on. So that that is um, where I want to be. Well, you know what? You're uh, you are actually teaching though, Derek, aren't you? I mean, that's why you joined Noxema to like pay it forward and go. Well, look, how do we actually improve the industry and share learning? So. You are actually teaching, um, and a pretty broad audience too, by the sounds of it. So, well, I, th I think so, and it's 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 all about influence, and you mm -hmm. cannot influence unless you know your subject and you've got the skills and resources around you to be able to direct that and make that credible to influence people. To say, you know what, that's a better choice to make, and I think that's a large part of what the regulator is trying to do. There is yes, we've got our laws and so on there, but we've got a privileged access to access to information there. I think it's our duty now to use that information. And apply it there for the benefit of people actually been able to manage that risk there so yeah that's the teaching aspect of it um uh, give, give me a soapbox and I'll, I'll talk from it well we thank you very much today derek for coming on this soapbox and uh you know sharing a bit about your passions and you know what's happening in the oil and gas industry uh very very interesting and um yeah no thank you so much for coming along and sharing well great and thank you for uh the time you've given me. Um, it's its you know, uh, an important area for all of us now. And uh, if I can make a contribution to that, I'm pleased that I've been able to do so. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, uh, listeners, that brings us to the oh, end cool. of the episode today. Um, don't forget, we do video these things over Zoom. So if you'd like to watch the video and see Derek's uh, beautiful face, uh, then you can do that over the uh, over the Flourish DX YouTube page. Uh, we also have short clips that we'll share on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page. So feel, follow, feel free to follow that. Uh, while you're on LinkedIn, Joelle and I are very active on there. So feel free to follow us or uh, connect with us directly. We're also very friendly. So slide into our DMs if you want to have a bit of a chat. <laughs> um, so thanks again, listeners. That, uh, that's the end. And we'll catch you next episode.